Good morning. Hi. Do you remember what we plan to do today? Uh-huh. It is exciting, isn't it? For many years, Franz Kafka brought great happiness and pleasure to grown-ups. And now it's time for kids to share in the fun too. Uh-huh. <laughs> Without further ado, let us begin. <laughs> Kafka for Kids starts as a slightly perverse musical for both kids and grown-ups, sometimes bordering on porn, even though there's no nudity involved, all based on Kafka's novella Metamorphosis, Die Verwandlung, published in 1915. As is well known, a young man named Gregor Samsa, a traveling salesman, living with his parents and his sister, wakes up one day and discovers that he has been transformed overnight into a giant vermin. The engine of the comedy, and I would say that this novella is first and foremost a comedy, although it doesn't end with a marriage, and is the desire of the parents and the sister to hold on to a sense of normality. Although a brother and a son living in his room as a giant vermin is everything but normal, of course. All the different and sometimes cruel and erotic strategies to hold on to this normality to keep the facade alive is what is driving this novella. From the very first sentence, Kafka is pushing the narrative as, as far as he can, and it's unavoidable that the loving parents and sister become more and more helpless and sometimes openly sadistic. The continuation of the status quo against all odds always requires a sacrifice. Now, Rory Rosen turned this novel, as I mentioned, into a musical. Of course, turning Kafka into a musical is slightly absurd, but if Anne Frank can be turned into a musical, and it's, this happened a few years ago in Spain, why not Kafka? Rosen's adaptation is very loyal to the original with some interesting inventions. For example, a man who looks like a doctor and who is called the bearer of bad news. The musical itself is also focused on the process of adaptation, on the transformation of the novella into a play for children. A bearded man is telling parts of the novella to a kid, played by an adult actress, a casting that enhances an uncomfortable yet fascinating perversity that can be found throughout the musical. Rosen's film is about two hours long, but after one hour and 20 minutes or so, the show is interrupted and suddenly we are not in a musical anymore, but we are witnessing a panel on, the, on military law and the question, what is a child? Reason for this panel is the detention of a 12-year-old Palestinian girl in 2016 after she was found guilty of an attempt to manslaughter. She had apparently approached a settlement with a knife under her coat. The actress who was playing the child is now playing a tormented expert on this matter. And she quotes, among others, Israeli legal counsel, Colonel Doron Ben Barak, who he himself quotes from a verdict that legislation done in secret is a trait of totalitarian regimes. He adds, these lofty words in the spirit of Kafka's book still hold true. Indeed, which book by Kafka? Question that's being asked also in the movie. And although I know that Rosen started working on this project before he came up with the idea to end the musical with a panel on important legal and philosophical questions, I could not help but think that it all started with this remark by Doron Ben Barak. Kafka not as an author, but as an adjective, an icon, used consciously or unconsciously in an attempt to comfort us with the idea that even though the law and especially the military law, is absurd and often not just, there is aesthetic pleasure to be found in the ice-cold words of the law and the lawyers and prosecutors and the judges and the deeds of those who claim to protect and uphold it. So Rosen's movie is not only about the question, what's a child and what is family and how does it function? The latter is also one of Kafka's preoccupations, but also what is Kafka? Or to be more precise, what is left of Kafka? and also about the weird pleasure that engagement and activism might give us.
Other people's pain, especially the pain of other people's children, might upset certain people. I can safely say, might upset us. We might want to talk about it in order to pro protest the grotesque injustice that is playing out in front of our eyes. But because in the movie the panel comes direct, directly after Rosen's highly successful attempt to transform Kafka's metamorphosis into a musical for toddlers, there is a suspicion that the indignation, the echo of indignation that can be found in the voice and the words of the legal expert talking about the detainment of the 12-year-old Palestinian girl, girl D, is just a continuation of Kafka for Kids, of the musical. That was my introduction to uh, my, my thoughts about this, this work of art, this, um, this movie. And I hope that those of you who, hasn't, who haven't seen it yet will do so in the near future. Um, Rory, my first question comes from something you said in an interview to an Iranian artist, Babak Afrasiabi. And I quote you, there's, ask yourself the question, should Kafka be adapted for toddlers? And then you say, when I first had the idea back in 2009, it seemed obvious to me that the question was indeed rhetorical. And the answer is so clearly, no, he should not. The funny and painful potentials arise precisely from the preposterous, perverse, and violent nature of such a premise. An idea clearly doomed to failure. And then you add, Kafka, I felt at that point, was my last remaining sacred cow and was thus ripe for abuse of loving. My first question is, if, if, is this what you should do with a sacred cow, abuse of loving? And I felt that there was not so much abuse in your movie, much more love than abuse. Why did you <laughs> label this abuse of loving? Well, I think that uh, you're absolutely right that there is an ambivalence there. It's not really only uh, abuse, but I think that uh, at the time I was thinking of my works as um, a forms of self-betrayal and self-negation. That is that by denying something or questioning something that you hold very dear, uh, something opens up. There is a different possibility to see things, to self-reflect and perhaps also to self-incriminate. You mentioned the word perversity, so also maybe other kinds of pleasures suddenly become available or handy. And uh, it is also true that uh, I did do certain things that I, I thought were uh, risque on my own grounds. For example, perhaps the most clear example is a project called Live and Die Eva Brown, where I assumed the position of Hitler's lover. So being the son of a Holocaust survivor, this would have been the absolute sacred cow, but it really helps perhaps questioning what kind of forms of totalitarian um, remnants do one has in oneself and self, of course, both in the private and the public meaning of the word. So I really felt, and that was after coming back from a, a film festival in Marseille where people actually detected the influence of uh, Kafka in my work that uh, I hold Kafka with uh, such veneration that it would be funny, but also productive to show my love or express my love through something that uh, is somewhat abusive. And uh, I think, you know, it was Gilles Deleuze who said that that was precisely what he does when he writes about an author that he likes. It's a form of, uh, I think he called it anal rape, you know, so there is a lot of passion and love and consideration of the body that is being uh, violated, but it is nonetheless an act that has a kind of a violent uh, dimension. And uh, in this case, of course, the comic effect has to do with this uh, violation. Uh, I, I was later surprised to find that it was not so for other people, that people in earnest try to make Kafka fit for toddlers. There has been such attempts. But for me, as I said to Babak at the time, it seemed obvious that it was a comical premise that allows me to uh, uh, explore uh, my reflections and experiences of Kafka in a way that was surprising to me, you know, first and foremost. Uh, so that's my, you know, initial explanation for this. Uh, yes. mm -hmm. 
Expression. Before we before we go deeper into the movie, I, I was surprised that that you you mentioned your last your last remaining sacred cow, also now and then also in this interview you you speak briefly about your other sacred cow, Eva Braun, the Hitler's lover. These are such a different sacred cows. How can you? No, no, no. The, I I think the sacred cow is the notion of Holocaust representation. Holocaust, okay. So I for many years I thought uh, that uh, the Holocaust could not be represented properly in art. And I, I uh, felt very polemical vis-a-vis -vis works that try to do so, either because they were really cleansing in their own morality by a, a full identification with the victim, which I saw also in the culture that I come from Israel, uh, politically instrumentalized very often. You know, we are the victims, therefore, if we act violently, it's in self-defense, you know. Uh, we are the victims, therefore, it is a mythological other, the German, who's evil. We are actually good. Um, but also in terms of the artistic means, you know, uh, proper or respectable art tended towards abstraction. So what is being represented, you know, is the inability to express anything about, you know, this horrendous event that leaves you speechless. So my attempt was to deal with the representation of the Holocaust by the exact opposite means to create an excess of representations to identify and to identify uncomfortably with someone who's not a Nazi herself, but is in love with the Führer. So, and to implicate myself in the process. So there is a kind of a multi-layered uh, imagery that uh, combines my own childhood photographs, uh, children illustrations, Nazi imagery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is what I mean by self-negation, beginning with something that seems forbidden, a respectful, <clears throat> vulgar perhaps, uh, obscene, but then of course finding in it nuances and uh, and a space, you know, a space to think and experience and and feel. Um, yeah. And did this project? Uh Make you make you change your mind about the possibility of representation of the Shoah or the Holocaust? Did did you um, change your opinion afterwards? Do you now think it's possible to 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 use art or literature to talk about this event, if I may call it an event? I, I, I well, I, I it's a it's it's a great question, and I don't have a full answer. Because I think that what I was uh, talking about was uh, really my own position. I, I thought that art should try to tackle uh, important and momentous uh, things that constitute our identity. And I think the Holocaust certainly qualifies as a kind of a constitutive event. Uh, and on the other hand, I felt for many years that it was impossible. And I was, as I said, I felt very critical towards the people who tried to do, to do that. I think that I can recognize several things, and, and also before I did it myself, that I did find respectable. Uh, uh, for instance, Mouse by Al Spiegelman, you know, was uh, for yes. me a very interesting book. Even though still there, there is an, uh, clearly an identification with, uh, with the victim, you know, with uh, his father. Uh, but it certainly encouraged me to think of alternative ways to, to tackle this issue. But again, Live and Die Zeva Baun is just one example of a kind of a model of uh, a beginning, you know, pursuing a project that at that point I was really feeling that was persistently at work, you know, in what I was doing. Uh, so that was the beginning. And by the way, I, I felt I was failing. So I, I left the project uh, for many years and then it was re-triggered by circumstances. Um, Important. Um, Speaking of, of, of representation, in, in Kafka for Kids, and, and you also, you, you name it, you, 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 you talk about it, there is this the representation of the of drawing of um, Gregor Samsa as a woman. And in the movie also, you, there is this uh, letter that Kafka wrote on uh, October 25th, 1915, to his uh, publisher, that by, by all means, he doesn't want to have a drawing of Gregor Samsa as the woman on the cover of his book. So you know that Kafka really didn't want to have this, that, that this was for him something forbidden, you could say. And uh, you go against his wishes, which is totally fine as far as I'm concerned, but still it might be <laughs> other people might have other opinions. 
And um, you make drawings of Gregor Samsa as an, in, as an insect. So why was it important for you not to hide uh, uh, the image of Samsa as this creature that's human and not human at the same time? Well, you know, obviously, uh, Kafka is very right to wish the insect not, the vermin not to be drawn, because as you know, he keeps changing in a kind of a dream state a perception throughout the book. Uh, the charwoman, the cleaning lady, describes him as a dung beetle. He yeah. occasionally is being described as something akin to a cockroach. Suddenly, he has many legs, jaws change into teeth. So there is a lot of um, a power in this kind of dichotomy between a very prosaic description of the daily events in Gregor Samsa's life and the fact that the, he keeps, he's not very stable, you know, in terms of uh, his uh, morphology, his what kind of an insect is this vermin. Uh, a, and clearly it is the most um, uh, overt form of uh, betrayal. It was also the first, the very first idea that I had and and it made me giggle because it seemed so silly. And again, later on, of course, I found that there are so many editions of the Metamorphosis that has those drawings, expressive drawings of insects on them. Yeah. Um, but this is the obscenity, of course, of, of uh, just vulgar or naive um, uh, reception of Kafka, uh, which is, of course, very common. Uh, also, I think in in literary terms and in the way that we use uh, Kafkaesque as, a, as an adjective, it, it is often very, very um, shallow. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, while doing the drawing uh, is, is an act that has an absurd obscenity to it, it also began a pursuit of beauty, a certain uh, aesthetic approach that has its consoling or, uh, you know, uh, qualities. And um, and it also provided a, a leeway into thinking seriously about childhood, so that children is not only the um, you know entities that are subjected uh, to become a tool in order to abuse Kafka, but actually notions of childhood and and uh, our uh, position vis-a-vis -vis childhood are explored. And I mean that not only in intellectual way but also in in a motive and aesthetic way. So there is, a, 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 I think that the, the aesthetic world is very important in this film. And it, it, it began, I was lured into it by this very, let's say, ironic beginning, ironic image. Yeah. No, it's clear that, that, is, that, that the aesthetics of the movie, that, that it's very consequent and, and extremely beautiful. But also I was struck by the fact that this this beetle, this vermin, this insect, whatever you want to call it, is in the drawing so much more likable than in the text. There's always when you when you talk about um, childhood and children, the the, the beetle, the the, it's, the the vermin, it's so he's sweet. There's a sweetness about him, and you feel for him much more in the text. Also, you can understand the position of the parents and of the system more and more that they really that that he's that the beetle is just. Uh, something that 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 is hindering them and that is making life impossible for them. But in your adaptation, your movie, he's sweet. You can imagine that a child, seeing him, or even an adult, would like to to be for a while like this sweet creature. There's no, yeah, no. That's okay. a great comment on on two levels. First of all, because you're right that while Kafka, you know, if you read the letters to the father. It's very narcissistic. The father is presented as this uh, person who's uh, guilty of uh, yeah. so many abuses against the son. And it's easy for us to identify with the son. While in the metamorphosis, you're absolutely right. We can feel for both sides. I mean, both yeah. sides are monstrous almost equally. Yeah. Or we can feel repelled by both the family and the son. Uh, but I think that uh, it was the result of... Uh, Really, uh, if if I began thinking about toddlers in relation to this story as a kind of uh, ironic position, as I said, and the form of betrayal, it became interesting only when it became more uh, layered emotionally. And part of this uh, layering was to create a lure. You know, I, in my mind, the aesthetic uh, precedent was something like Pee Wee Herman, you know, this 
ingenious, brilliant uh, TV, American TV series for kids from the, from the 80s, which is so beautiful and, and, um, and also adult in a way. Uh, very excessive, very sweet, but very alluring also for you know, people who are, uh, have a very sophisticated visual perception. And um, other dimensions came about, which I think are inherent in Kafka, such as you know, uh, certain um, qualities that are really very much, uh, that has an affinity to children's tales, the theme of the metamorphosis itself, but also if you think of the three lodgers uh, yeah. that uh, act as one, it's a very childlike uh, motif. Uh, and also other qualities like uh, ecstasy, pleasure, playing, I mean, becoming an insect for, for Gregor, there is a point at the second uh, chapter where he's, you know, he's really is climbing on the walls that's in Kafka, not only in, in my own work, and also bulimic pleasure uh, when Grete feeds him for the first time and he becomes, you know, his belly is swollen. So um, uh, pleasure, uh, childlike pleasure, play-like pleasure, laughter, uh, and also what I added to it perhaps was seduction, visual seduction. <laughs> That's clear. And then my question is, why did you decide, because as I mentioned in my introduction, is this grown-up actress, a beautiful actress, played extremely well, who is playing a child. And this made me, I said it was a bit of an exaggeration, but there was this association with porn. It was like this, this sexiness that was not supposed to be there, but it was there without really being sex. It was, it was uncomfortable. Why did you decide not to have a grown-up actress uh, as a kid and not... Um, a kid or a youngster? Well, what first of all, I must say that uh, I noticed that Hani Firstenberg, this uh, really great actress, is here with us tonight, which for me is really moving because we just had the, the Israel premieres and she lives in New York. So Zoom now... Made this possible, yes. Made this, made this possible and it's, it's great to have her with us. And I must say... On two levels, I mean, I, first of all, I, I knew that I wanted to write it for this specific actress. Uh, we worked before uh, on a monologue of dysfunctional comedy, which I was in which I was stunned by her performance. Um, and, uh, and really there was, uh, if there was a concrete aspect of the ploy that I knew I wanted to realize was to have Hani perform again and perform as a double role. But of course, having the, child as an adult offers us this doubling because we are all children at a certain level. Uh, we are always, we are left as the sons. You know, we play the roles of fathers or, or mothers, but we always already remain uh, the children as well. And uh, I think this kind of infantile quality is very clear when you deal with Kafka, who uh, died young, but not that young, not as a child, no. but he's the constant son. But also... In art in general, if I may be allowed to be a bit uh, banal, you know, uh, there is a kind of an infantile quality of sustaining yourself in a kind of a playful situation when you do art. And, and I had this, um, you know, I, I always uh, uh, like to, to challenge for myself and for my audience a binary divide, you know, so it can be the divide between present and and past the divide between what is repulsive and what is attractive, the divide between the public sphere and the political, but also those age divisions, which are dim, you know, and should be more fluid, perhaps. Uh, and Hani has those incredible childlike qualities to her. I mean, the way that she listens to the story. Uh, I heard someone uh, say that uh, they could have looked only at her for the entire movie, her reactions to Jeff Francis, who reads her the story. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, it's not a full answer, but it's, but know, it's point. Yeah. let's go back uh, briefly to the, to the question of the uh, uh, drawing of the, of Samza. You then come up in the movie with, with a great idea, namely there's this best friend of Franz Kafka who basically defends your decision. And the best friend of Franz Kafka is a shoe, his yeah, shoe. Of course, a very a shoe that's now worth a lot of money. And also, there's this, I mean, I, there's this playful, the wordplay that shoe, Jew, comes for a brief moment. So how did you come up with, 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 with the shoe of Kafka? 
which also become to to me the image of the shoe is almost like a phone. It's like yeah. like a device that's 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 so much more than a shoe. Yes. But also I was I was um, intrigued by by the whole suddenly there there's the, the shoe is the is the Jew or is this the Jewish part of Kafka? Could you elaborate a bit on that? <laughs> Well, I, I really thought the pun was simply a silly uh, wordplay, nothing more than that, but it, it probably hides uh, certain things as well. But you're, you're right that there's a cell-like quality, something between a cell and the seashell, you know, where, because they listen to the show like this as if to hear the sea. But of course, in a, in a world where the chairs uh, and the lamp and the ball and the wardrobe all speak, and dub uh, the voices of the, it's a very animistic world. So animism has a variety of manifestations and the show then becomes an obvious one. But I also thought it was really, you know, for me funny in a kind of a silly way to add another uh, kind of fetishistic element that has a slightly, it's, you know, it's like a masochist trope, uh, the show. Uh, and and I think that in this novella, in the Metamorphosis, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, other tropes of male masochism. I think that uh, I'm not, I will not be the first reader to notice that there are some even uh, direct references to Zachar Mazoch, you know, to uh, Venus in furs. Uh, there is a, a photo of a woman in furs above Garrigo Samsa's um, yeah. uh, table. There is the Chao woman who's this big woman and he's an insect vis-a-vis -vis her presence. Uh, so many tropes and symbols of male masochism appear overtly in the novella. So the shoe is a fetish that the child wants to lick, actually. And licking the shoe again is a classic uh, masochistic image. Uh, also plays, you know, uh, on that level as well. Oh. I also thought, because you mentioned also in the interview with uh, Af Afrizi Abi, this book by uh, Deleuze and Gattari, Kafka toward the minor literature, mm -hmm. and they write that one of the ingredients of this minor literature is that it doesn't have a territory. It's beyond territory. And I thought also that the shoe is like a symbol for, not only for the walking Jew, but also for not having a territory, not a language that's not confined to a certain place. Yeah, that's maybe a very interesting uh, observation. I, I absolutely, I think it's a very interesting idea. I, I didn't think about it in terms of signification, you know, like uh, uh, an object means a certain thing. But I certainly think that those uh, levels of association and echoes are uh, viable. And um, I thank you for this uh, really interesting uh, reflection. The movie is also interrupted a few times by ads for people's delicatessen, which is also, of course, it's a, you can say it's a comment on whatever commercialism or what, but that's maybe the less, least interesting take on it. Um, because the people food, but the food is so clearly disgusting. And so the images of the food are so um, awful in an interesting way that, that it makes you want not to eat instead of eating. So what's what's the what's behind this decision? The decision to have this air is is how how can you explain a bit why you decided to do this? Well, I was uh, for a variety of reasons. I was really interested in uh, eating disorders, and uh, of course, it's a great topic in Kafka, both in his literature and in his life, and it's a topic also in uh, in the Metamorphosis. You have. Uh, yeah. Uh, Gregor eating profusely at the beginning and then fasting and almost, you know, being very, very emaciated towards the end. Uh, but even the text itself of the ad is taken from Kafka. It is a bulimic fantasy that appears in um, a, an early part of the diaries. I don't remember the exact date, but uh, I can give you the footnote later on. Okay. Uh, and it's almost verbatim uh, one of the entries to the to the um, uh, diary, uh, this idea of, uh, uh, you know, inserting into your mouth the, the sausages only to have them come out from your anus almost immediately and bonbons filling into your, and there is this impure notion of mixture. So the, the dishes that we shot are actually all, each and every one looks delicious, but when you take, uh, you take them and you uh, superimpose them, 
uh, in high resolution, one on top of the other, it's a, it's a, it becomes an image of objection, you know, of uh, the or what Bataille would have called the formless, you know, the unform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It becomes disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> to put yeah. it simply, yeah. In a way, but you play also because there are more. You, it's clearly, it's. I mean, you're very, as I said before, you're loyal to Metamorphosis. But for example, there's also the Stintorelli, the painter, that comes from another, from another novel, from the process. So, right. But you said also this part. I was not clear why this is painting and it's a forgery. This is whole small chapter. Tintorelli is there, and I was for a while. I was because uh, I was slightly confused. I said, where does Tintorelli come again from? Am I, is my memory fooling me? Is this, is this a metamorphosis or not? So there was this, was this one of your goals that, that you wanted to play with, with people who know Kafka a bit, who know Kafka well, but because of the, it's, it's so natural there that, that, that they might be fooled to think, oh, this is part of, of metamorphosis or what's the, what's the message there? Absolutely. This confusion was really key uh, because the movie itself goes through a metamorphosis and in the beginning, even if it is disorienting, the division seems very clear. You have a chapter, then you have uh, the theme song and ads. And some of the ads are trailers for upcoming episodes. But at this point, the ad breaks become very confusing because they're longer uh, and they begin to confuse the time of the ad of the episode to come with the child who's responding to what didn't happen yet. And Titorelli himself, who knows that he's about to be, to be killed, to be burned. Uh, so there is, you're absolutely right that it's very confusing. The, the, the episode is from uh, the trial. And uh, indeed, when Josef Kau is being accused and he doesn't know why, he goes to seek uh, notions of how he can be vindicated. Everyone recommends to him to go to, to seek Titorelli, who painted litigators in the court. And of course, there was uh, also the joke of uh, using Picasso as uh, to to uh, to be Titorelli, because Titorelli only paints uh, two trees uh, in a lawn, so he's like a machine reproducing painting after painting of the same thing, the exact opposite of the versatility of uh, of Picasso. But another important thing is that, uh, of course, there is a discussion of of legality, uh, a very very interesting uh, discussion of legality and of uh, the way that legality can be multifaceted and multilayered, even with, with notions that seem to be clear cut, as such as vindication. Uh, and that in a way subtly leads to what would come later, the uh, discussion uh, uh, by the legal expert. Yeah. We will talk about this. Um, in the beginning, the narrator says uh, to the child, that Kafka brought great pleasure to adults. Now it's time to bring this pleasure also to, to uh, kids. I was reminded of something that Milan Kundera wrote, the Czech author, in one of his essays that um, he despised Max Brod, the friend of Kafka, who in his uh, novel about Kafka, about a Kafka-like character, really emphasized the suffering of Kafka. And he said that we should not uh, treat Kafka like that. He didn't suffer for us. He enjoyed himself for us. So I was reminded of this part that he wanted to emphasize that part. But this narrator also made, makes another interesting remark. He claims that metamorphosis has a happy ending. And of course, I was a bit surprised because I thought Samsa dies. I mean, he's um, abused for many reasons by his family and um, apples are being thrown at him and uh, in his flesh. Well, you know, of course, all this. But maybe from another perspective, because if you go back to the text, there is, of course, this, this sentence about the sister, Greta, that she might now be able to find a, a husband and that she will prosper in later life. So from that perspective, there is a happy ending. And yes, and they go to have a picnic. So uh, yes. it's very much uh, as uh, the child in bed reminds us, it has a kind of an affinity to the end of uh, Red Riding Hood where it's a monstrous death, the animal is being killed uh, quite viciously uh, after being birth, uh, uh, after giving birth, as the child says, because both uh, Red Riding Hood and grandmother come out of the, his belly uh, unharmed. And then they sit and have a picnic with the hunters. So uh, it's, a, it's both a monstrous end and a happy end. Yeah. But of course, the interesting part is that, that Samza is, is to his tormentors, it's his a, a brother, a son. So are you, is, is, is this, does this imply that sometimes family, you have to kill family men, members or to abandon fam, family members or to sacrifice your own blood or 
people clo so close in order uh, to go on with life? Or do I take it too far? I will. Have a happy ending. No, I mean, I, I don't really think the ending is happy, to be honest. I think uh, the metamorphosis has quite a grim ending. I think also that Kafka did not, was not very happy with the ending. Uh, it was too much of a closure for him. I think that Kafka liked to keep things uh, unresolved. And there is a kind of a closure that is perhaps too tight. Uh, but also in my own film, I feel that the movie becomes uh, sad, sadder and sadder as we go along. I mean, uh, there is a cathartic moments and moments of pleasure, but uh, there is a kind of an emotional weight that uh, grows uh, as the movie progresses. Uh, but I, I think uh, also that um, uh, it is good to follow uh, Deleuze and Guattari in resisting interpretation. So it's not only the son or it's not only the figure of the Jew as some people would have Kafka, and it's not only the person who's being uh, oppressed by bureaucracy, um, and it's not only an animal, as uh, I mentioned in the discussion with Babak, uh, having read the recent very interesting uh, interpretation where uh, the author said, well, this is exactly how one would treat a vermin, you know, uh, an mm -hmm. actual animal at home. Um, you mean the piece by Rama Harel? Yes, exactly. Good. Uh, so all those echoes, I think, are really pertinent, and Kafka gives us uh, 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 threads to pursue each and every one of them. But I think uh, that for me, at least, uh, it would be a kind of an imposition of Kafka to to reduce it all to a kind of uh, you know Oedipal uh, scene or or any other scene for that matter. There is a kind of um, equivocality or. Uh, yeah, in, in the experience of Kafka. Let's talk about the break in, in the movie after one hour and 20 minutes or so. In this talk with Afra Ziyabi, you say, so when the case of D, the Palestinian 12-year-old who was jailed in Israel happened, I was already midway writing the scripts and I felt I could continue writing and ignore it. The problematic of what is a child had such legal and political concreteness, absurdity and urgency, and the fact that the formal frame was that of legality and law, which is so crucial both in Kafka's life and work, that the convergence seemed necessary. Even as at that point I thought of it again as a form of self-betrayal, this time betraying the narrative and integrity and cinematic coherence. So all this you gave up because of circumstances, of this, well, of this fact, the fact that this he was the youngest a child ever who was put um, was thrown into a prison for adults because apparently there was no space, there was no prison for um, um, uh, underaged female prisoners. Well, so I why how come that, you, that it was so important that you really changed the whole movie, the idea? I must say that uh, perhaps uh, the way that I've um, uh, described it uh, in the conversation with Babak. Uh, was a bit uh, dramatic or perhaps uh, a, a bit confusing because, of course, there is the risk of uh, damaging, you know, this beautiful aesthetic construct that I was laboring on, but this risk was worth taking. It's not like uh, I, I use the metaphor of uh, weight that would sink a ship, but the ship really would not sink. It would become a different form of, of vehicle, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and I think that in my work, I, I, I it, often I, I do not intend for it to happen uh, originally, but there is always the convergence uh, of the private in the erotic sense, in the you know the private sphere, with the um, political. The political is somehow asserted in the body. Um, it happened in many different works that I did, also in *Live and Die* as Eva Brown* that I mentioned before where you know, notions like Nazism and fascism are implicated in your own body and your own desire in your own bodily fluids. And uh, so uh, it was, it was um, uncanny and scary to, to make this uh, great uh, twist. But in retrospect, it was very much akin to other things that happened in my work. Uh, and also when I said that it, it felt like uh, I felt compelled to do it, it was also because 
the parallel was very striking, you know, uh, the same questions could have been raised. The, the big uh, unknown was how to do it, because uh, initially I thought it would be a fully uh, documentary approach. I actually organized a kind of a think tank of uh, legal activists and experts and uh, etc. only to realize immediately that it was a no-go, that uh, I could not use them because these were all good people, you know, it, it was people that you could not have any equivocality about. So if I spoke before about you know, ambiguity between good and evil, between yourself and the other, these were people where it was clear they were serving the good um, work of, of protecting, you know, minor Palestinian detainees. And that is really why I thought of uh, inventing uh, a fictive legal expert uh, yeah, but of course, I mean, not pe assuming that some people would not know that this came up during the process of creating this this movie. It feels that it affects everything that was came before. Yes. So you cannot see the movie without thinking that this was an idea that that existed. What I said also in my introduction from from the very beginning, and that that um, Kafka for kids. Is a way of dealing with 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 legal questions. With with at what at what age can you throw uh, 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 kids into jail, and and what are the implications, and how do you deal with laws and military laws? So it affects everything that, that was before. You were aware of this, this, of course. I assume that that it would change. Yeah. No, of course, of course. I mean, the mo when I say that the movie goes through a metamorphosis, the very it's, body changes; it becomes yeah. something else. Yeah. And they, because I, of the past changes. Yes, absolutely. The yeah. Right, yeah. Of course, the past is very much defined by the present. So uh, this is also true about, again, Leben Eva Braun or any work that deals with history in the, in the present. The, the past is very dynamic. The past is very malleable. The past changes constantly. Um, you know, think of Russia at the present moment. Uh, the the position of Stalin is changing in these very days, you know, in the in the Russian imaginary. Uh, suddenly a notion of a greater Russia comes back to life after it seemed totally prohibited, let's say, 15 years ago. So, yes, the past is always contestable and... Uh, and changeable and usable for yeah. political uh, purposes. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. Um, this legal expert, she names a few... Um, really existing people. Uh, among them is military prosecutor Avram Fechter, who um, was very much in favor of detaining um, minors, because uh, he thought, he said that this would prevent other minors from uh, becoming, uh, uh, protesting or uprising against the occupier. And then there's Judge Meir Shamgai, who, was, who um, gave the Palestinians the opportunity to go to the Supreme Court in Israel, in order to, so the military court was not the last station they could, um, uh, was not their last court. And as we all know, I mean, the military courts, 99%, uh, I believe, of the cases um, are going out uh, not so well for the defendant. Uh, I mean, they're all uh, found guilty. Um, so, but then you, the, she may, not you, this, this legal expert, makes the interesting uh, remark that she says, of course, um, Fechter is the, is the gas pedal of the occupation, and Shamgar is the brake pedal. Mm -hmm. And it seems that Shamgar is, if you go back to the to the to the uh, to the well, to good and evil, and to those, yeah, yeah, then it seems he's the good person, and he's 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 helping uh, the the victims. But then she says, no, this is you. You need to, if the occupation is a car, you need also the brake pedal in order for the car to continue driving. So this appeared to me, this seemed to me also like a comment on the whole panel itself. That the panel itself was less innocent than it could appear to be to, a, to, a, to somebody watching the movie. I, I absolutely accept this comment. It's, a, it's an interesting and important insight that uh, really pertains to what I spoke of before, which is a form of self-incrimination, you know, that uh, so that reflection on the uh, ethics and aesthetics within a political context is not only pointing at a subject which is external to oneself, but is also, you know, it implicates oneself as well. 
And uh, you're absolutely right. I, I will add two more uh, points here because you mentioned Fechter, that there is a longer version of the monologue that uh, exists as a kind of a sovereign film, a short film. It's uh, the monologue in Kafka is about 16 minutes and the longer version is uh, 23 minutes. And this Fechter, as you will see if you'll uh, watch the longer version, is also responsible for other amazing uh, legal notions, such as the fact that each Palestinian freedom fighter is by definition a terrorist. So this was also you know, this great legal mind, a right-wing uh, great legal mind. And you're absolutely right to point out that uh, Shamgar, uh, who's uh, this kind of enlightened, progressive, uh, responsible uh, legal personality, very much venerated in Israel, is also you know, the person who Mm, enable the legality in Israeli terms of the occupied territories, which of course goes to counter to the international law. Yeah. And the, the other comment that I wanted to add was uh, kind of poetic, which is the, the three cars in the monologue. First, there is her own body as a car, uh, and she feels that something is wrong. You know, as a public speaker, she might have made a mistake, and suddenly she's, she's ashamed, but it's not clear if she's responsible or something outside of the car, which is the body. Then there is the car that you pointed out, you know, you pointed out uh, this, the car of the occupation. And then of course there is the car in the end, this kind of erotic ascension fantasy where uh, Kwame comes from the future to pick her up in, in his yellow car, you know, to so she can get rid of this uh, nonsense of the occupation and uh, yeah. Also, I mean, she's um, sn smelling herself and, and um, she's commenting on the difference of that she smelled very differently when she was a child, that smell changes. And then when you spoke briefly and you said that fascism has also to do with bodily fluids, I, was, I made a connection between smelling yourself and the idea that, that fascism um, is also that, that, that comes through bodily fluids. Can you, can you maybe comment on that? Or is this just my fantasy that, that the smell and the bodily fluid, because of course bodily fluids sometimes smell. Um. No, I think that, uh, I mean, it, it, the notion of smell again appears in many of my works as this kind of, uh, you know, repressed uh, sensuality. Uh, we, uh, as you know, from the enlightenment on, we venerate vision and the smell is something that is more animalistic, more sexual, uh, more related to the lower part of the body, to the genitalia, to the feet, to the armpits. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a film and a, a novella uh, where the animalistic and the human are being somehow, you know, they somehow confront each other and morph into one another. So, and, and uh, in fact, there is a part in the description of uh, uh, Gregor Samsa, which I echo in the song called The Merry Vermin, where uh, he speaks about becoming blind, but his sense of smell is, is heightened. Uh, presented, of course, in the, in the song is a, very, is a great advantage, you know, because vision is a cheating whore. Um, yeah. <laughs> the movie ends, the film ends, Basically, you go back to the to the to the idea of, of Kafka for kids. There's this song, uh, the occupation, the panel, the military law is not forgotten, forgotten but pushed aside. And in this song, there's the the sentence: "Perhaps my dreams are dreaming me." Um, I thought, how you how can how can how you, how did you make this 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 step from talking very seriously about an important episode? of the ongoing uh, occupation of the Palestinian territories by the Israeli uh, military, and of course by, the, by all the settlements, to going back to Kafka. Why did you decide to go back to the, to the musical theater for kids? And why didn't you stop with, with the panel? And what, what, how, how should I, what should I think of a sentence like, perhaps my dreams are dreaming me, is all, well, what, what, it's, it's the, how, how is, is the, is there still a thing that we can call reality? That we can have consensus about, that we can, that we, that we share? Is there, is there still a shared reality? Well, I, I, I think that really, uh, it's a very, uh, on a certain level, it's a very simple 
a song or poem that deals with uh, fears and thoughts that I think many children do have. You know, am I real or perhaps what happens in my dreams is real? And then perhaps I'm a kind of a remnant of the dream. She also asks if she grows up, will she grow small again? And will the friends that she sees in the dream, will they have the power to protect her? So again, this, I spoke about binary divides uh, before, and we can speak about the binary divide between dream and reality, very much a topic in Kafka as well. Uh, did he wake up from the dream or didn't he? He believes initially that he did not. Um, um, and the divide between uh, old age and childhood, which I mentioned before, um, uh, disavowal of, uh, of growing old, uh, which we all experience, I think, on one level or another, when we look at the mirror and we fantasize on how we looked maybe 20 years ago. So I saw it as a, as a very simple, uh, sad song. Uh, a, sad, a sad song. Yes. I mean, it's a song that is uh, almost in, you know, in opera you speak about like motifs. So it brings back the motif of what is a child, the song that is yeah. being er heard earlier. And I must give credit to the composer Igor Khotogolov. Uh, it's not the first project that we do together. He's a great musician. And it was really planned as a kind of a contrapunct where those two songs, What is a Child and uh, the Nursery Rhyme, converge and become one, you know, uh, same chords, but uh, different melodies. And the words of musing on the question, What is a Child, are combined with those uh, notions and fantasies and fears uh, that the child might have before falling asleep, you know, uh, uh, which to me seem very, I mean, it's not only me, it's also Zhuang Tse, right? Wakes up and wonder if he dreamt of a butterfly or perhaps the butterfly dreamt of him. So it's also Chinese philosophy. It's not only my, my own simple thoughts. But, uh, but I think that it's not only Zhuang Tse as well. I think that it's something that is quite common for children to be confused about what is the dream exactly. And, but the way you talk about now this, this about this song, this poem, uh, it seems to me that's not only children who are obsessed by this question. It's it's adults also. It's it's absolutely yeah. yeah. I agree. So the what's a child is not easy to answer. As no, I think it it isn't. Um, but, but is it also if from a legal point of view, shouldn't it be easy to answer or easier? No, I think I think it's not. Uh, it's it's never easy, and it's never stable, and we can have our doubts uh, about uh, many different definitions of uh, of childhood. But I do think that uh, we, in the occupation, uh, the definition of childhood becomes yet another form of abuse, and uh, there were contents, of course, that I chose to omit, not to even address in the monologue. Uh, and we actually held with Hani Fürstenberg an actual panel discussion where we shot several real uh, legal experts and activists who gave their own uh, presentations, some of which pertain to, you know, the way that, for example, detaining children is meant to break up families and sometimes villages. Um, the experiences of children themselves, you know, the way that they're being called kidnapped, in fact, in the middle of the night, etc., cetera, et cetera. So, horrendous things that were not relevant to the rhetorical model of the, of the monologue, but are really instrumentalized uh, by military law in a way that is uh, more extreme and uh, uh, horrifying than, you know, than what we are, what we are accustomed to in, in civil, civil circumstances. Well, in, in, in the monologue, there's this clear, very clear point uh, she is making, you, you are making, that there is this huge distinction between Israeli children and Palestinian children, because according to the Israeli law, uh, you become an adult when you are 18, and uh, for the Palestinians, from 12 to 14, there is this thing called youth, uh, 14, 16, tender adult, yes. beautiful term, but it's also used in a very ironic way in your, in your movie. So there, the distinction, the divide, the apartheid, whatever you want to call it, starts already in this, in this, in this law. Absolutely. I mean, settlers in the occupied territories are not accountable to the uh, military um, no. uh, authorities, yeah. but rather to Israeli uh, civil law. So it's a totally different ball game. They cannot be accused for something that is very habitual 
uh, for a Palestinian person, such as, for example, throwing stones, uh, this would be a, a serious, a grave offense for a Palestinian, but not an offense at all for a, for an Israeli. So, um, yeah. Did this making the making of this movie did it change your relationship with with your last sacred cow Kafka? Is Kafka still a sacred cow for you? That's an interesting question. I I, I mean I spent the last five years reading, of course, even more Kafka than than before, and the more Kafka scholarship, some of which I didn't uh, quite like. But uh, no, I think Kafka is, uh, for me, is, is really a great writer, a very versatile. There are things that I like more and things that I like less, uh, as I hinted before. Um, you like less his letter to his father, which I, also... Well, I, 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 I think that uh, Kafka has uh, obnoxious and uh, sometimes sadistic elements uh, and narcissistic elements. Uh, the letter of his father, I mean... It's a great piece of literature on the one hand, but personally, I, I also have uh, an ambivalence towards it. Uh, I think this kind of sadistic uh, um, resonance you, is also to be found in some of the letters, especially to Felice Bauer, with whom he was engaged. Um, well, he tortured uh, her. He, he tortured himself. Exactly, he, tortured, I mean, but, yes. uh, he tortured himself, he tortured her, but... Uh, you know, the, the story, uh, the mythological story of Kafka, as promoted, for example, by Alias Canetti, uh, on, in his book on Kafka, was that Kafka was the victim in this relationship. You know, he was, here is this uh, Prague intellectual, and here is this bossy, uh, strong uh, woman from Berlin, you know, who's abusing him. And I think it's really, I, I don't see eye to eye with Canetti on this point at all. Uh, also, I mean, what you said, and I think it's also clear from your movie, you, you dislike the identification or the easy identification with victimhood and victims. And in his letter to his father, Kafka appeared to identify, uh, to, to accuse the father of so many of things, of his, of things that went wrong in his own life, which makes it sometimes unbearable to read that also for me, I must say. Yes, I, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that we are all we all know this feeling of uh, rage towards the father. We have all been children and, and felt that. Or at least, I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say all because it's a bit <laughs> of universalizing. Yeah. But I can say that I definitely had a lot of uh, claims against my father and rage. But uh, part of it is, of course, uh, you know, growing up to see, you know, the limitation of your, of your uh, perspective as a child and maybe... Uh, improving your dialogue with your uh, father, becoming more independent by keeping a bigger distance and uh, yeah. the letter to the father, uh, it's as if the past is not in the past, as we spoke before. It's yeah. all it's in- claims are very fresh and uh, the yes. rage is pure. And yeah. so it's, yeah, it's, it's a strange uh, text. Is, is this also a way of, of at least saying partly goodbye to childhood by, by allowing yourself some distance between you and your parents and, the, the perspective you had as a child? Is, is the adult a person who can easily, much more easily than a child, have take the position of different, take, can, is able to see different perspectives? Is able to change roles maybe easier than a child? I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know how to answer uh, this question. I, I know that um, having a variety of perspectives is something that uh, 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 is part of the uto- utopic horizon that art provides us with, you know, that in art we can fantasize and we be- we can easily become someone else, which is a great, you know, uh, thing about, about art, about literature, about painting. You can project yourself into a fantasy and therefore you, you, you are expanding or changing. So, uh, but children can do that as well. No, but I was only speaking about this kind of, you know, uh, I think that when we're children, there is a kind of a very absolute presence of the parents that also has to do with uh, dependency and with, uh, uh, which of course changes when you become adult. It also changed for Kafka, you know, it's, uh, but not in the letter. Not in the letter to his father. No, definitely not. 
I'd like to end with, with, with a rhetorical question. You were asking yourself in, in a conversation with Babak uh, Afruziabi, um, you ask yourself the question, and I found it a very Lacanian question to, to a certain degree, is transgression inherent to the dialectic, to the dialectic of law and desire? And you don't really answer this question. So maybe this would, this is a nice opportunity to, to go, to go into the subject a bit deeper. Is, is, I mean, we, we started this conversation by talking about transgression. You, you named the transgression of, of using the idea of identifying with, with, with the, with the perpetrator, with acting out a fantasy that you yourself were in love with, with the Fuhrer. And then, of course, the transgression of, of uh, drawing the insects, drawing the vermin that, that Kafka didn't want to be drawn. So how much, what's the connection between law and desire? And how much do we need transgression in order to, to f experience desire? Wow, that's a great, uh, great uh, topic for uh, a series of seminars, not, not even one uh, <laughs> for Paul Lacan. Uh, but you're absolutely right that it's it's a question that is uh, that I think is 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 perpetually uh, uh, being asked in my own work. I think in Kafka's work, in uh, also in work that uh, to to quote another book by Deleuze, uh, he um, uh, suggests that the comic comical mode has a kind of a transgressive relation to the law. So uh, comicality, aesthetics, uh, transgress uh, sexual transgression, all have to do with ways of disavowing or challenging or defying laws. Um, and I really cannot answer if it's uh, imminently so. I think that it's something that can be argued and, and rethought uh, and, and in, in a performative way, hopefully, not in a way that uh, has an, you know, an authoritative single answer you know yeah but, yeah in a playful way the way yes, uh, yes. i would say so yeah the way children play and the way as you mentioned before although you said yourself it might be a bit uh, too banal is that of course uh, Yes, I lost if, your last sentence. I said, before you said, although you, you commented on your own comment that it was maybe a bit banal, but you said the playfulness of children is connected, is so much connected to the idea of art. Yes, absolutely. You're right. I'd like to thank you for this conversation. I hope you will be able to come to the Netherlands uh, in the future. So we're I not dependent so. on Zoom, although it's, mm. it's enabled us that, that, that your, your actress, somebody in New York could, could listen in. And maybe in the future uh, we can have a conversation with, with I mean, with, 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 for example, her as well. Um, I'd like to thank you a lot for, for uh, it was a joy talking uh, to you. And it was a great pleasure of, of dealing with Kafka through your movie and dealing with the occupation through your movie, which also, um, I would not, yeah, it, 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 it changed a bit, at least during the movie, uh, my perspective. Thank and you I so much, Arnon. It yes. was uh, no. really a pleasure to, to talk to you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good evening and talk to you soon. Good evening. Bye -bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess this is the end and this now maybe opportunity to drink some wine or yes, yes. or water